I, I remember being on a farm in Germany. This was on an organic farm and uh, very sophisticated, uh, beautiful winter barn. And they had to put their, their beef cow, cows in the, win in the barn in the winter because it's wet. And they said, you know, they had, for a few months they needed to get them out, especially the calves. Fair enough. And uh, so they, it was a gorgeous barn. It probably held about 100, 150 beef animals and calves. And, and uh, all winter, as they brought straw in the manure pack, they would go like once a week and throw corn into the manure pack. You already know where this is going, right? And so at the end of the, the, the winter, they would send the cattle out to pasture, and then they'd send in the pigs, and they'd go rooting for those fermented corn seeds. In the process, they would, they would compost the manure. Th th that's an animal that's worth keeping. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> um, and uh, so we have to make animals work, and it's exciting. You were talking about the farmer is worth keeping? <laughs> the farmer is worth keeping, too. Is, um, so uh, one of the other pro oops, one of the other pro processes here that I just wanted to show you is this nutrient transfer. Uh, in uh, in uh, uh, nomadic systems, especially sub-Saharan nomadic systems, it's not it's very customary for uh, pastoralists who have their cattle and they're walking through uh, to make arrangements with crop farmers to keep their animals on their sort of plots of land overnight. It's called nighttime corral. And there is sometimes monetary exchange or some kind of a value exchange that goes on between them. And so um, Joanne Thiessen Martins, who's been here all week, she works with me, she, uh, 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 she actually has done uh, nighttime corralling experiments with our sheep. And uh, it's amazing. We had them just grazing alfalfa during the day and we just put them to a plot of land at night. That's right, just for 12 hours and then we grew crops on there you know and then they transfer a lot of nutrients so the animals can be used to move nutrients around your farm so if you extract phosphorus with these trees you don't need to fire up a diesel tractor to move that phosphorus into your cropland these are goofy ideas but you know we need to be looking uh, for more resource efficient options yeah so I'm, I'm going to switch places with Gary now and give him the thing and, and he's going to lead the discussion for a while Um, we, uh, I'm not an animal scientist, uh, we've uh, grazed, I, I, my experience with sheep and grazing alfalfa comes from Australia where it's very dry, so bloat risk is a little bit lower simply because there's not dew on the leaves. But um, as I understand it, the big problem with sheep and grazing alfalfa is actually red gut and not bloat. Uh, so we, we've not had problems with sheep um, bloating. Uh, and of course, if you're, some of you may be grazing alfalfa with your beef cattle, and, and there are a whole bunch of rules there, like, you know, don't let them on hungry, the alfalfa shouldn't be wet, add some grass to the alfalfa, put a bale of dry hay uh, at the beginning of the paddock, and all that type of stuff. But we could talk more about that later. And I bet you, how many of you here are gray, having your animals graze alfalfa? Anybody? Okay, there's a, ha there's a bunch of hands. Keep them up for a minute, so whoever asked the question can look around and, and have a farmer to farmer. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Neil. Neil Dennis, he's an expert grazier. Go talk to him. He's got some answers. Okay. Martin was um, talking about the theory, and I want to translate that into three farm examples of people that, that have used these theories and actually applied them. And so he talked about reduced tillage. He talked about crop livestock in, in integration. And yesterday he talked about varieties and so that's what I want to talk about so but I want to back up and say before we apply any principles and create our farm or do things on our farm we got to look at what are we trying to achieve in our life right and we can measure success if we meet these goals here these are goals that are established long time ago and I sort of live by these and I think, I'm, I'm expecting that maybe these would satisfy you as well. But for, if your farm is going to be successful and you can achieve these things, 
I, I think then that's a meaningful measure of whether we're successful or not. The other thing that I found helpful for myself to figure out how should I farm is by using this principle here. I came to this understanding um, not that long ago, but that all farms produce the same thing, exactly. And that's high quality energy. That's what we produce. Sometimes it's in the form of wheat, sometimes it's in the form of lentils, other times it's in the form of hay or uh, chickens or eggs or beef, but it's all high quality energy. That means the more efficient we are at producing that high quality energy, theoretically, the more profit we should make. And if you look at Martin's work, he's done research with graduate students that looks at energy conversion of different farming systems. And conventional agriculture uh, produces about six units of energy out for one unit of energy put in. Okay, so that's to the farm gate. Uh, organic agriculture, especially with perennials in the system, produces a 1 to 12 or 1 to 14. So pretty well twice as much energy coming out of, a, of an organic system as a conventional system for every unit of energy put in. So that means in the future, as energy inputs become more expensive, organic farming is going to become more profitable. It's just going to keep on becoming more profitable. So here's the three examples I want to talk to you about. First of all, Ian, uh, Linda and Ian Grossart's farm, and that's where I want to just pick up one component on their farm, and that's crop livestock integration and how they made that work. I want to talk to you about Keith Bamford's farm, and really this is Martin's research farm. Keith Bamford is his excellent technician. Keith is an excellent farmer. And then I want to talk to you about my own nano farm. I'm now retired from the University of Manitoba. I am a subsistence farmer, and my farm is 25 acres in size. And I am using all everything that Martin has taught me over the years being associated with, with the university uh, and try to put that into practice. So I'll show you what, what I've done doing with varieties there. So first of all, Linda and Ian Grossart farm in uh, just this big hill right at Brandon, Manitoba. And they have about 2,000 acres and they have crop the livestock integration. And so we took our students to visit this farm just this September, right? Yep. Our agroecology students. And so he told us that livestock crop integration provides weed control. And it doesn't do it for all crop, uh, for all weeds. And especially we saw Canada thistle on this farm. And the cows did not eat the Canada thistle. So that's a bit of an issue. Um, grazing green manures can reduce your tillage to some extent. And we're talking about uh, reduced tillage as being a goal, but keeping in mind what Dr. Fernandez says, we have to be very careful about that because reduced tillage can reduce our yields if we don't manage it properly. And of course, grazing Biomass is the best way that I know of to increase your organic matter the quickest. And it also provides nutrients for your following crop in a very good way, in an economical way. So what I've done over the last number of years when I teach my crop production students, which are conventional agriculture students, I have started introducing them to the idea of putting, to grow some of their own nitrogen on a conventional farm. So the numbers I'm using in this spreadsheet, and I can give you this spreadsheet, you can get it, it's not up yet, but go to all of Martin's work is at a website called Natural Systems Agriculture. So just Google Natural Systems Agriculture, you will find it. You will be able to find this spreadsheet, if this is interesting to you, it's just an Excel spreadsheet. And the numbers in blue up here are the numbers you change, the price of wheat, the price of canola, the price of livestock, the price of nitrogen, fertilizer, phosphorus, and the price of diesel fuel. And then I did an eight-year crop rotation. So in Manitoba, many, many conventional farmers grow wheat, canola, wheat, canola, wheat, canola. That's all they do. So that rotation with today's prices and average yields gives you minus $53 per acre 
That's including all the costs. So that's including your uh, fixed costs, total fixed costs, and it's including labor and management. And the reason I included labor in there is because I want to be fair in comp comparing a gray green manure when I introduce it because we're going to need fencing and we're going to need labor for gray green manure. So I'm, I'm charging $112 uh, per acre for some of that green manure in terms of labor and management. Okay, so the next one is let's do the same wheat canola, wheat canola, wheat canola, but every third year we add a grazed green manure. And probably it'll be oats and peas in Manitoba. Um, readily available seed, relatively inexpensive. What happens to the net income over eight years? Unbelievable. It goes from minus 53 to plus 53 dollars just because you're growing some of your own nitrogen and because I've factored in the added benefit of a little bit of um, you know weed, weed control that comes from a, a green manure crop. But the ultimate is having your annuals mixed with perennials. And if you have as short as three years of alfalfa in your wheat canola, wheat canola rotation, you go up to $133 per acre. And this uses on the grazed green manures and on the alfalfas 175 pounds of live weight gain, exactly the number Martin was using in his uh, slides, and at today's prices of beef. And again, these are conventional prices, not organic prices. But to be fair, last year these numbers didn't look as good because the price of beef wasn't as good. Now some of you may say, crop livestock, and for, I can't deal with that. Well, I don't like managing livestock either. And on my little nano farm, this year I hired a flock of sheep. In the past, I've had my own sheep. It's a house. I've got to provide all this stuff for them. And then I've got to sell them, find a market for them. So I got my neighbor to come in, and I had provided the fence. He brought in the sheep and I moved the fence every two days. They grazed that green manure that was flowering, standing down to stubble, you know, in three weeks. And then I sent the sheep back home, so I didn't have to deal with it. So it was a business alliance I made with a livestock producer. And there may be opportunities for some of you who have a younger generation that wants to farm, but your farm isn't big enough to add a second income. Well, add a new enterprise. Give the young person the livestock operation. Say, that's your operation, and you farm on this land. And you just put the two together. You don't need more land to add the livestock. Now, some people would say, well, if you're grazing all that green manure, the biomass from this high, which is like 8,000 pounds per acre, down to nothing, aren't you going to reduce your yield? Where is all that biomass going? Well, Mother Nature, sometimes we think she's wasteful, but no, she isn't. She is thinking about cycles. 80% of the nutrients that go into the cow go back onto the land in that place that you're grazing. And they're in more favorable form. So Haroon, who did a, uh, a PhD with Martin, uh, found that approximately after a green manure, just regular plow down, 80 pounds of nitrogen, a grazed green manure, same biomass, 120 pounds of nitrogen. It's just there. It's an available form for the crop the following year. So it doesn't reduce yields. So the principle is that you want to provide organic matter nutrients in an economical way. So you are producing income in that green manure year. The proof of concept is that Ian and Linda were very proud to tell us that on their 2,000 acre farm they have provided a complete living for themselves for many, many years. They sent their kids to university on that income. They did not have to have off-farm jobs. That is proof to me that the system works. If you can provide an income for yourself. So that's a mistake. They have 2,000 acres. Okay, second example, Keith Bamford's farm. Interruptive uh, 
if I'm saying something. Sorry, did you say something? No. I've been listening to every word, Gary. So here is the research farm in Carmen. It's a beautiful place. There are nine different kinds of soils here. So you could pick your soil from clay to sand. Uh, Martin has his organic research, his major organic research farm is in this place. And Keith Bamford is his longtime technician who's doing a marvelous job at this. So I interviewed Keith and I asked him about the potential for reduced tillage. Now, he came up with an interesting idea. Understanding, and Martin has found too, that his graduate students, Kristen Podolsky, for example, try to reduce tillage and you drop yields. It, it, you know, you, you have to be careful how you do that. So Keith suggested, if we're trying to reduce tillage, let's reduce the number of tillage events in a six or eight crop year sequence. Like whatever our crop rotation is, let's reduce the number of events. But during the event, you don't reduce your tillage. So you do high tillage when you do tillage. And Keith also says, we should be more strategic and careful in our green manure year to take care of those weeds. Like, don't go easy on those weeds. High tillage. In, in that year, we have opportunities. So he says, maybe one year, you see the weeds coming. Well, you wait, let them grow, then cultivate, and then plant. Some years you might plant early. If you plant early, then you plow it down early if the weeds are coming. And you start again, you put in the second crop. I mean, organic farmers, I think, are used to this. They plant often, and they plant at many times of the year. And I think that's something, the principle, I think, is to try to keep your ground covered with plant material, because you want to pr produce nutrients, you want to produce organic matter at your opportunity, but you don't want to do it at the sacrifice of letting the weeds go, okay? So that's, that was his suggestion. And this is the crop rotation that is being practiced in, in Carmen now. So two cash crops, a grazed green manure, two cash crops, a grazed green manure. Uh, sorry, year four is not grazed. Year four is the reduced tillage. No tillage in that year at all. What we do is roll the barley hairy vetch roll it out. The neat thing about hairy thatch is it's not killed by rolling. Everything else, of Canada thistle is killed. I mean, it crimps the stem, folds it over, it stops its growth. Any, any erect plant, like a, like a lamb's quarters or a red root pigweed, anything like that will be killed. Hairy vetch keeps on going. It keeps on going until the frost, until serious frost. How much frost can hairy vetch tolerate? Well, it, uh, yeah, easily, and uh, the trick is to pick the right variety, and then it'll die over winter. Yes. It won't in Lethbridge, but it will most other places on the prairies. Okay. So, so that's a beautiful thing. So then the following spring, and you need, what do you need, seven or 8,000 pounds per acre to make this work? Yeah, yeah, you usually be say six as a minimum, okay. which most, most, many of the prairies can grow. Minimum, and then you roll this over, and now you've got this thick mulch on the surface of the soil. What do you do with that? Does that scare you? Okay. This, uh, Gary's going to show you a video here of Keith uh, zero tilling flax into uh, mulched hairy vetch. Describe the drill. This is just a Ben Dick swift current offset no till disc drill. It's a very simple machine. Keith has kind of perfected this system. I think we've done this for nine years in a row now. And uh, Gary, you take over. You were. And when, when I first saw this in operation, I said, Martin, you have made a Eureka discovery here. Because this flax field was clean. It started off beautifully uniform. The seeds are into moisture at half an inch, right? They are, the moisture is right there at the surface. And his yields have been up to 35 bushels per acre of flax. Now, that's not his average yield. His average yield is 20. 
over eight years, but um, he has on occasion produced fantastic flowers. Actually, the, the average yield includes the years before we did this. And so when we just look at this system, our yield is more like 25, 26 average.